Hello there, and welcome to this, the final video for the evolution of terrestrial life. So this is video number seven, in which I'm going to be talking about the evolution of life on land during and since the Mesozoic. Let's jump right in. So obviously, life on land continued to evolve into the Permian. But if you remember from our lectures which covered the Carboniferous rainforest collapse, uh, the Earth in the Permian period became a lot more arid. In fact, the period as a whole saw a massive desert covering the interior of the supercontinent Pangaea. The impact this had on climate is very clear from the image that you can see on this slide here that shows temperatures and degrees Celsius um, at around the time uh, of the end Permian extinction based on climate si simulations. And you can see that, that life got really quite hot during the Permian period. In terms of the vertebrates that were around on land, amniotes can hatch eggs outside water. And this allowed those animals, the amniotes, to occupy new ecological niches. A result of this is that we see further diversification within the amniotes to the major uh, to, to the appearance of the major lineages we have alive today. So in the Permian and Triassic, we see a split into the mammal-like reptiles. These are things called synapsids, which ultimately become mammals today, and into a, a group called the diapsids. Modern day representatives of this group include the crocodiles, lizards, snakes, tuataras, turtles, and birds. So um, some major important um, uh, pieces of evolution in the history of tetrapods occurred during this time period. As we've already established, many of the other groups of organisms on land were already relatively firmly established in their essentially major modern divisions by this time period. Then of course, between the Permian and the Triassic, we have this massive extinction that we learnt about in our extinction letter, the PT extinction. And after this, we know that recovery took until the mid-Triassic period. When you kill 95% of our species, obviously recovery takes some time. And we see lower diversity for tetrapods in this recovery period. But that brings us heartily into the Mesozoic. So let's Let's go and learn about what happened in the Mesozoic. Well, in the Mesozoic, in general, I would say things get increasingly familiar. That's definitely true in the world of arthropods and plants, for example. Many groups of plants that are alive today had evolved um, or did evolve during uh, the Mesozoic. And major divisions of the vertebrates that we would recognize today, although the things that make up those divisions may differ, were also present by this point. Essentially, the only extinction to ever really hit land-based arthropods was the Permo-Triassic. So essentially, after um, the PT extinction, we have the modern form fauna for insects, myriapods, and chelicerates for arachnids, essentially. Some major things did happen, however. So Triassic biotas were generally uh, dry and highly seasonable in terms of their, the climates they lived in. And so think of lots of deserts. Um, in these environments, plants that need lots of water struggle. And so during the early me Mesozoic, we see an increase in the gymnosperms that were around and thick cuticle seed ferns. These are, are plants that essentially deal very well with a lack of water. We also see some cool, interesting evolutionary events. Some land-based reptiles returned to the waters. So on the right, I've uh, illustrated this with a fairly um, egregious shot of a uh, mosasaur from Jurassic World. Uh, I think a gratuitous shot is maybe the uh, better word there rather than egregious. It's not bad necessarily, but I didn't need to. Um, use a picture from Jurassic Park, but still, these were cool animals, and these represent a return to the sea of a um, of a, a tetrapod group. This occurred earliest in the Permian, but marine reptiles in general diversified into the Mesozoic. We also know that the first dinosaurs, as represented by this other Jurassic World beast, um, so the film, not necessarily a Jurassic animal, um, because we know the first dinosaurs evolved in the Triassic. They were primary vertebrate contributors to diversity for all of the Mesozoic in terms of life on land. Dinosaurs 
are diapsids and they make up the terrestrial macrofauna throughout the Mesozoic. So what we could say, if we wanted to paraphrase what I've just told you, diapsids increase in diversity during the Mesozoic, while synapsids seem to struggle slightly. We also see in the Mesozoic that vertebrates take to the sky for the first time. Active flight requires many adaptations, especially with the sternum, the clavicle, the scapula, the humerus, and the wrist in terms of vertebrates that fly um, today. And for example, during this time period, we see uh, the first flying vertebrates, the pterosaurs, evolving. So these actually appeared at first in the Triassic. There was then a major extinction at the end of the Triassic period. This extinction led to the disappearance of most diapsids and some synapsids. And one of the things, uh, one of the impacts we think this had is that it led to an explosion in the diversity of dinosaurs. It looks like um, from the fossil record that dinosaurs exploited the newly vacated available niches and diversified um, into those to become this dominant group that we recognize. Um, some synapsids, of course, do cling on to survival and then ultimately evolve to be mammals after today. What else happened during this period? Well, Pangaea started to break up during the Jurassic. These paleo maps from the um, Cretaceous show that the world is starting to appear more familiar um, in terms of its, its geography and approaching things that we would recognize today. So it's a very hot time period in terms of um, its, its climate. And we see that conifers dominate trees throughout the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous period. We are starting to approach essentially modern looking ecosystems. At least these are definitely ones that wouldn't look quite so alien to us as the early land ecosystems that we've met in previous videos would have done. But that doesn't mean there weren't major evolutionary events that I can tell you about to finish off this video. One of these is the evolution of angiosperms or flowering plants. These were the last major group of plants to appear in the fossil record, as you can see on this graph on the right hand side here, showing time and the diversity of different plant groups. Um, that there have been a series of, of plant groups that have basically um, uh, overtaken each other um, in terms of the major contributor to diversity, and sometime in the Cretaceous, angiosperms appear and then become uh, increasingly dominant towards the present day. So what can I tell you about this? Well, the first flowers appear in around the mid Cretaceous. Then what we see is a rapid diversification of angiosperms in the late Cretaceous. They were the dominant plant by the end of the Cretaceous period, by which point they made up 80% of plant diversity. The radiation of the angiosperms in the Cretaceous led to fairly profound changes in the composition of land um, plant communities. They were a really species rich group. And their rise to predominance did lead to extinctions or marked declines in the diversity or abundance of many other groups of seed plants that had previously been quite important, namely the ones that you can see listed in this gray box here. This is a group of plants that has extraordinary developmental and evolutionary plasticity, and it could be that that's one of the reasons for their success. But another key reason that we think may have contributed to their success is their co-evolution with insects. So insects, such as this beautiful um, Hymenopteron, that's I think a bee, shown on the left-hand side here, um, are, act as pollinators. By being pollinators, they spread the genetic material of these plants over a wide area. Wind pollinated plants cannot achieve this to the same extent. How exactly this evolutionary relationship started, we don't really know. It may have started with insects feeding on the plants and the fossil evidence is relatively patchy as to the exact mechanisms. But what we can say is that this um, co-evolution between plants and insects may be responsible for the great diversity in both of these groups. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship that may have led to um, the success of these groups that we see in modern day ecosystems. So that's a, a really major event. Obviously, by um, the end of the Cretaceous, you know that there was an, or at the end of the Cretaceous, I should say, you know from our extinction lecture that there was an extinction, and that was a sad time for um, many of the 
organisms that were alive at the time. For example, the non-avian dinosaurs took a bit of a hit during <laughs> a bit of a hit, died out completely at the end of the Cretaceous. But there, there have been other interesting things that have happened in terms of evolution um, since the KPG extinction. So what we've seen since this time is that grass dominated ecosystems, such as those shown on the left hand side here, this kind of like um, prairies or tundras, those kind of, um, those kind of ecosystems, uh, where grasses make up a significant fraction of the flora, become globally widespread. Tropical savannas uh, make up more than half the land area at low latitudes post KPG, and grass dominated ecosystems are abundant in parts of North America and Central Asia. And this is actually something that we accept today, but it's really quite recent. So the earliest firm records of grass pollen are from the Paleocene of South America and Africa, somewhere between 60 and 55 million years ago. There is a traditional view that the rise of grasses and grasslands is closely tied to the observation that equids and other mammals, such as shown, that shown on the left and on the right here, this gorgeous um, ungulate of some form from Africa, um, the evolution of these groups, which develops uh, 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 kind of teeth that have very high crowns, they're called hypsodont teeth. Um, this group evolved in the early Miocene from about 23 million years ago, and many people have made the case historically that the evolution of these high crown teeth was a key um, part of the evolution of grass ecosystems. And the idea is that these high crowned teeth reflect the fact that um, these groups of ungulates, things like horses, evolved to eat grass, and because grass has lots of silica in it that grinds away teeth, these animals have evolved um, really high crown teeth. So there's an element of co-evolution going on here as well, though whether it's mutually beneficial or not is, is an entirely different matter, and it, indeed it's probably not. We see that fossilized grasses and increased amounts of grass pollen appear in the Miocene in some abundance and become um, really quite common as we move towards the present day. And of course, in this time period since the KPG, our own species has evolved. It's a really exciting area of research right now, and I wanted to give you just a single example of why this is. And to do so, I'd like to introduce the Denisovans. This is a human species that was only covered, discovered sorry, in 2010 in a cave that you can see marked on this map here, along with a few possible routes out of Africa for modern Homo sapiens. This was first identified from a single bone that was found in a cave in the Altai Mountains in Siberia, a bone about the size of the one that's shown in the middle here. We found a few more remains since, but they're, they're still very bitty. We've got a partial mandible and a molar tooth, for example, but we've not really got much of an idea of what the whole skeleton of this species looked like. But what makes the field and this species so exciting is that we can use genomic techniques namely the study of ancient DNA, to better understand the DNA of these organisms, these, these, this human species, and this, these organisms sounds very uh, pejorative, not what I want to be saying at all, um, and to better understand human evolution as a whole. So we now have, have both Denisovan and Neanderthal genomes, which can be compared to the genomes of archaic, so old and modern humans, to shed light on gene flow, population structure, and adaptation in these groups. This work shows, for example, that modern humans have interbred with both Denisovans and Neanderthals. For example, this paper here by Prufer et al. from 2014, from which I sourced this image on the right-hand side, um, offers a confident estimate that the Neanderthal contribution to the genomes of modern humans is about 2% for humans that are, have their origins outside Africa. So Africans have no detectable Neanderthal history in their DNA. Such studies also suggest the existence of an unknown group of uh, hominids as a source for some modern human DNA. There were modest levels of gene flow into the Denisovans of a sequence that is different to any known group of hominids at the moment. We don't know what this group might be, um, but it implies that there is at least one, so, one more so far undiscovered archaic hominin group whose DNA we haven't got hold of yet. 
So these genomic tools are really helping us understand the evolution of our species as a whole and better understand uh, the routes, for example, by which humans have moved across the globe and the, the origins of our species as a whole. So I think it's a really exciting um, area. There are lots of different areas of active research into human evolution. And we're actually very lucky in um, Earth and Environmental Sciences to have a world leader, Dr. Marta Pina Miguel, as a member of our staff currently with us, who has created a video for you, um, which I've put on the website just below this one, or I suppose possibly above this one, depending on how I decide to organize the page, as part of the bonus material associated with this lecture. Marta is an expert on the evolution of bipedalism, so walking on two feet, in humans. And I would really encourage you to take the uh, opportunity of having a world expert talk to you about this with both hands and to watch that video, because it's really exciting, really cool stuff. Um, so yes, that is available for you once you've finished this video. And that brings me to the end of this romp through uh, the evolution of terrestrial life and indeed to the end of this course. I will reiterate what I said in my introductory video that I really hope you've enjoyed this course. I've definitely enjoyed teaching you. It's been a, an absolute uh, pleasure and good luck in your exam and everything else that you choose to do as you go forward uh, into the rest of your degree and into the working world after this. So thank you very much for coming along for all of EART 22101. It's been great. See ya.